Our story began in 1974, when news of a tragedy reached Norwegian lock engineer Tor Sarnes. His favorite American singer, Connie Francis, had been attacked by an intruder in her hotel room. Hmm. Tor couldn't believe that this had happened. He resolved there and then to invent a door opening system that would provide a unique key for every hotel guest. His invention was Vincard, and it changed the whole lock industry. For decades to come, hotel guests all over the world could finally feel safe and secure when they arrived at their destinations. Vincard L-Safe has been an industry pioneer and world-leading brand for 40 years. couldn't think of any way to make it more dramatic. <laughs> so this system called Asa Ablo Vision is deployed in more than 150 countries, over 42,000 facilities, and it's protecting millions of door, doors. Um, we don't know exactly which brands are affected, but uh, according to Asa Ablo's own pages, at least these chains are using this brand uh, to protect their facilities. Or if you're more visually inclined, it's protecting places like these, these, and also these kind of things out there on the sea. We are the pen and teller of InfoSec, except that we are not rich, famous, or funny, and the shorter guy actually talks. <laughs> right, Timo? Uh, moving on. Uh, we, so we both work for F-Secure, which is a Finnish cybersecurity company, and we do consultancy there. So the story goes back to 2003, when we were attending an invite-only hacker conference in Berlin, Germany, called PH Neutral. And once we got back to our hotel, we noticed that one of our friend's laptop had been stolen from his locked hotel room. We immediately notified the hotel staff, but they didn't really take us seriously, and today we still can't figure out why, because we were like really, well, anyways. So we boldly decided to go where gender neutral has never gone before, and started, wanted to have a look if there is anything about this great system called Asabloy Vision, at that time called Vincard Vision. So a quick Alta Vista search returns zero hits. So challenge accepted. That, I mean, if you're new into hotel locking systems, you, you need to start with building a, uh, an attack tree. So most people seem to think that all these doors are connected to some place, but 95% of the market is actually being, being uh, are, are using passive doors, which means that a typical door or electronic clock only has a battery, real-time clock, and some rudimentary logic behind it. So these are completely standalone. So in order to build an attack tree, there are a few options. So you can go after the mechanical lock, you can go after the electronic lock, access tokens, and the backend system. And we did exactly that. So First, you need to understand the tar target a little bit better. The only thing we had was this. It was a Magstride card that was being used to open those doors. So we went to their website. Uh, this is how things looked back then, and started hacking. And by hacking, we mean browsing through FTP servers, because that's how you used to hack back then. And after finding these things from their open uh, FTP server, decided to have 
a further look. So one thing that most people seem to neglect is looking at patents, especially if you're looking anything that is not reasoned. Patents contain tons of use, useful information. So you can actually have a pretty solid understanding just by looking at the patents, how these things work. And you can find some useful fields so you can kind of understand what's stored in the access token. And it contains useful pieces of information. Like, I guess many of you know Major Malfunction. He did do some work on Max Stripes and most probably was reading the midstream to the wrong direction because it's actually read when you take the card out. It's five times more accurate. Breathing setup. So the first thing that we tried was bypassing the mechanical part. If you want to bypass the mechanical lock, obviously you're going to need a lock. And what's better than a lock is two locks. So we got two on eBay. And the first one, that one we dismantled. We wanted to see how it's built. We didn't find any kind of flaws in how the lock is designed or built. So what we, what we decided to do with the second one was to try to somehow open it without leaving any physical marks. We tried things like using powerful magnets to open the lock. No luck. We also tried hitting the lock with a rubber hammer. Now remember, we didn't want to leave any physical traces. Again, no luck. So this, this path failed. Later, we learned from our Dutch friends that if you want to bypass the mechanical lock, all you need is 15 seconds and equi equipment that costs maybe one pound. The way you do it is you get a coat hanger or a thick piece of metal wire. You slide it under the door, then you turn it up, and then you pull the handle from the inside. In a minute, you're going to see the same thing from the inside of the hotel room. So again, first you slide it under the door. Then you lift it up. You pull the handle. And that's it. Like I said, 15 seconds, less than one pound. Pretty nice. Now, if you want to protect yourself against this attack, what you can do is you can place a towel between the handle and the door, and that will prevent this attack. But obviously, we needed a better plan, so we decided to look at bypassing the electronic lock instead. And here we got off to a really good start. Like Tommy already mentioned, um, on those FTP sites, we had found a piece of software called Vision LockLink. And LockLink is the software that you use to reprogram the locks. And that's a pretty cool capability to have. If you want to run the software, back then you needed a device like Comeback iPad, one of those handheld computers that you see in the photo. So we got one of those, and we got the software running. We were able to analyze how the software works. And quite quickly, we learned that all the interesting stuff happens in a piece of hardware, not in the software. And that piece of hardware is called the contact that's the device number five that you see in the photo. The way the device works is that you connect it to the Compaq iPad, and then the other end, the one you see in the photo, you insert that into the lock, just like you do with a Mac Stripe key card. And that's how you program the lock. And all the interesting stuff happens in that, lock link, in that contact card hardware. Now, the sad thing was that we couldn't get our hands on one of those. We, we couldn't get it anywhere, so we weren't able to analyze how that contact card really works. The bright side of things, in a way, is that later we learned that this approach would have worked. The way we learned about it isn't really that funny, because in 2010, we learned about the assassination of Hamas officer Mahmoud al Mafu. He was killed in his hotel room in Dubai, allegedly by 
Mossad. And the Dubai police report says that the way the killers were able to get in the hotel room was by reprogramming the lock using the LockLink software. Now, if you want to get into a hotel room, this isn't the best way to do it, or at least not the most elegant one, for two reasons. Firstly, if you reprogram the lock, there will be a trace. You, you can later detect that, yes, the lock was reprogrammed. And secondly, what if you want to get into multiple hotel rooms? then you need to reprogram all the locks. So we decided that we need a more elegant plan. So what was left was more or less the access tokens themselves. So here the success criteria would be, first of all, to clone an access token, which should be easy to do, produce an access token with more privileges. So for example, if I were to impersonate Timo, I would be able to do that or create the master key so that you would have access to the whole facility. So we came up with a plan. First, understand max threat. Well, that's easy. It's you store some stuff there. It's usually uh, uh, it consists of three different tracks. Or if you're from Japan, you might have a fourth track on the front side of the card. Unfortunately, uh, well, yeah, this is how it looks like. Uh, typically, you have a start sentinel, you have some data, you have end sentinel, and some sort of a checksum. Uh, unfortunately, in Vincard's case, all the data was on track three, track three, and it was completely custom. So none of this stuff, the, all the standards, everything, it's kind of useless. So then you need to have an encoder decoder. So we'd used uh, this, uh, there is this German guy, uh, that's, that does this beautiful piece of hardware called Max Stripe, M -A -K, M -A -K Stripe. And it's completely passive, meaning that most of the encoders, decoders, they do their work on a hardware level. This doesn't do any encoding, decoding on a hardware level. Instead, you're using this piece of software that shows you here on the upper right-hand corner, you see the swipe speed. Uh, in the middle part, you see the modulation, and then for example, here in the lower right-hand corner, you can see how many times uh, that card has been used. For example, here you can use it. It's, uh, you can see that it's been reused. Um, you can, this, this middle part here is super useful because many of the copy protection schemes on Magstripe cards actually use double modulation. So the first part of the stripe might contain one type of modulation and the second part will use a different one. But with this type of hardware, you can analyze and make a copy of it. So if you need to have a few parking cards, this is the way to go. Um, the next thing was to get hotel cards. And by hotel cards, we mean plenty of hotel cards, like hundreds and thousands and, and so on. So, so that you have enough stuff for, for the analysis part of this project. Luckily, we have friends in low places. Greetings to Mikko Hyppanen, who travels like 250 days per year. And he has, he has um, provided us uh, uh, plenty of, with plenty of these calls. Then you need to reverse engineer the data on these tracks. It looks like this. And it's obvious that you can um, not do anything with it. So you can, you might, you might be able to deduce something out of it. And we've been very, very successful owning other hotel locks with this approach, uh, but it didn't work in this case at all. So we failed, and at this point, we just needed a plan. So the new plan was that we need to acquire the vision software and then reverse engineer it and come up with clever techniques. Luckily, we have internet, so you Google it, and you find the software. And then you reverse engineer it. And uh, it didn't really work that well, because it's a really, really complex piece of software. So we had to do some reading, um, about 500 plus pages, and then understand how it works. So we drew this map, this small mind map. When the Assabloy guys saw this, they, they told us that we have a better documentation of their system than they do. So first we 
took a look at some use cases. If you click on any of those use cases, you will have more information about how it's supposed to work. Also, we took a look at uh, how, uh, what kind of data is being stored on the physical lock. Once again, if you click on any of those things. So we kept adding and adding more features here because it's hugely complex. And once we went on with the reverse engineering, we keep add kept adding nodes here. You get the idea. Yes, we are armed autists. And then uh, the next step is to build a hotel. Uh, and if you can't afford it, then you need to build a lab. Uh, it looks, looks like a little bit like this. Uh, no stereotypes here at all. <laughs> uh, the problem was that this hardware, this beautiful piece of hardware, is actually crap. Um, we noticed that if you were to swipe the same card twice, you would get a different result every time. And I can tell you, this was hard enough already without that. So we had to do something else. We would have wanted this piece of hardware, but it's super expensive. And even with our contacts, we were not able to get it. So instead, we decided to go for an RFID reader, which is much cheaper. And we went, after, went uh, on with this reader. This is really nice piece of hardware only about, six, uh, about 60, $60 or so, easy to get and works according to the documentation. It works with vision, which was for us, it was kind of important. So immediately after 20 hours, uh, we were able to get it to work. Uh, it's kind of embarrassing because the only thing needed was to rerun the installer, but we didn't really figure it out. <laughs> so um, we spent like 20 plus hours debugging uh, the, the system and yeah let's not talk about that uh, but at this point we were able to create our own cards which is beautiful so we, you, you put the card there you can write the information there and you have a working <coughs> card for the installation but there was one problem we had a demo installation and Having a demo installation is not the same thing as having a licensed installation. Luckily, uh, we are trained professionals and we know how to read, so we took a look at the manual, and there is a screenshot in the manual with all the license information. <laughs> so we um, registered our copy of, of Vision, uh, that, and it was fully functional. And that's how you hack. Yeah, that's, that's a, you know, if you're not smart, you have to be persistent. Um, then the, there was a minor setback. We didn't know anything about RFID, so we had to do some reading. So we started reading a few documents here and there and learned that there are also multiple different RFID tokens. So. Most VIN card installations or vision installations are using either ultralight or ultralight EV1 cards. These are not secure cards. So EV1 is a bit better than ultralight, but the only difference is that it has a kind of a shared secret that is being sent between the card uh, or it, the, the secret is... Uh, uh, is shared between the lock and the card. But if you have a nice piece of hardware like Proxmark, you, you can just sniff the shared secret. It's plain text, and, and you, can, uh, you can use that. Uh, it's not protected in any way. And for the most part, uh, when we took a look at it, it's not really being used most of the times. And it's not a security feature. It's more like a copy, protections, copy protection feature. Now that we had a working lab, we were finally able to start really reverse engineering how the software works. Now, unfortunately, we cannot disclose all the details of how the hack works. Although Asa Abloy has already issued a patch, and we know that many hotels have also used the patch to fix the hotels, there's still so many vulnerable hotels that we don't want to put innocent hotel guests at risk by publishing all the details of how the attack works. 
That's it. Once we had plenty of those RFID hotel key cards, we started looking at the data on the cards. And we immediately recognized a sequence of 33 bytes. It was something that looked very familiar. And the reason is simple. It was the same sequence of bytes that you had already on those Mac Stripe cards. So you had the same, same structure. The way the data is structured is that you have a very simple single byte XOR encryption. The first byte is the encryption key, and it's also the checksum for the rest of the data. Once you decrypt that simple encryption, you get something like this. So you have multiple different logical values. Let's say you have a one byte logical value. It might be that you need to get five bits from here, then you get two bits from a different offset, and then the last bit from yet another offset. That's like a terrible data format. In, in order to deal with this, we used a tool called Kaitai Struct. This was super helpful both in documenting and visualizing the data. So the graph that you just saw it was automatically generated by Kaitai Struct. The only thing you need to do is first describe the data that you have. And the syntax is quite straightforward. You simply describe the sequences of bits and bytes. You label them, you give them IDs. Once you've done with that, then you can say that, okay, I have this logical value which consists of these bits, these bits, and that bit there. And that's it. The added bonus is that once you have done this kind of description, then you can automatically generate a deserializer for your favorite programming language, which in our case was Python. So quite, quite a handy tool. Now that we more or less understood the structure of the data, or at least we thought we did, we started our quest for the master key. So the master key is a single key that will open each and every door in the hotel. Our first attempt was to simply update the facility code on a master key that we had created in our lab environment. And the facility code is simply an integer that's basically a unique identifier for each hotel. We were hoping that, okay, maybe this works. It certainly didn't. I mean, now looking back, it, was, it would have been too easy, but it was worth a shot. We decided that we need to try, try something more simple, and we tried cloning a key. So taking a regular guest key and then cloning it to a physical RFID tag. <laughs> this also failed, and this was supposed to be simple, come on. Um, at this point, we were quite humble, so we went back to the drawing board, which in this case means IDA Pro and Immunity Debugger, and did some more reverse engineering, and we learned that the last four bytes that you have on those RFID tags, those are a checksum that's calculated from the RFID unique identifier that you have on the card and from the facility code of the hotel. So those are the two inputs for the checksum. Now, obviously, if you try cloning a card without being able to generate the checksum, it, it will fail. And the reason is that if you have two cards that have different UIDs, the checksum will also be different. We didn't use one of those Chinese cards where you can control also the UIDs. If we would have used those, then yeah, we wouldn't have had this problem. In any case, this is something that we, we had to learn in order to be able to generate those master keys. Now that we were able to create physical tags, clone physical tags, the next logical step was to try to simulate a key. Because the hardware that we were using was Proxmark 3, and it has the capability to simulate MIFR ultralight cards. Like, this should have been a walk in the park. And, and it failed. And figuring out why this one didn't work, I, I think this was one of the most challenging parts of the project. You will soon learn why. 
I went back to the documentation. This is the state diagram or the state machine of one of those ultralight cards. In order to write anything to the card or read anything from the card, you need to re reach this state that's called the active state. And in order to get there, you first need to go through this protocol called anti-collision. What it simply means is that if you have a reader, and within the radio field of that reader, being a lock in this case, if you have multiple tags, let's say you have two RFID tags, there needs to be a process for the reader to say that, okay, who's out there? Then both of the tags say that, yeah, I'm here. And then what the reader does is says, okay, now you shut up. You, I'm talking to you, tell me more about yourself. Okay, thanks, I'm good. Now you shut up. You, tell me more about yourself. Okay, and then the reader can decide what is the tag that it wants to talk to. If you simplify this a bit, you can think of it as a handshake between the reader and the tag. So imagine when I realized that we're not reaching the active state because that anti-collision protocol, the handshake, Fails. To illustrate this, we literally were able to sniff the traffic between the token and the lock. And our payload was exactly the same with the payload of the card that we had cloned. And it didn't work. Our clone didn't work, but the real card worked. It, it was kind of an out-of-body experience because you're looking at two identical dumps and one works and then the other one didn't. So we went back to the documentation and we started reading the ISO standards for the radio communication. And man, this is a lovely standard and protocol. Depending on the command that the reader sends to the tag, and also depending on the data, depending on the last bit that the reader sends to the tag, the tag has to wait a different delay. And that delay depends on what was the data sent from the reader. And to make this even more complicated, it's not like the high-level data that you work with. It's, it's the low-level radio frequency data, including the parity bits. So it took some time to figure out that the problem in the Proxmark firmware is on how this delay is handled. Once we understood the problem, the fix was easy. It, it wasn't that many lines of code. So we, we made a pull request. It was quite quickly merged the Iceman fork, and hopefully nobody ever has to suffer from this same bug again. Now, don't get me wrong. Without tools like Proxmark, we, we couldn't have done I mean, if we would have had to create a tool like Proxmark, design the hardware and do all that stuff, I mean, we would have failed. But still, it was quite surprising to us that Proxmark has been around for years, and I guess nobody else stumbled on this, on this bug. So I'm, I'm very happy that this way we were hopefully able to give back to the community at least a little. Also worth mentioning is that the emulation on Proxmark worked sometimes because if you were lucky to get the right data pattern the emulation would work but very often it wouldn't work it actually depended on the rfid uid that you have on the card so if you simulated a card with the right kind of uid it magically worked <laughs> wasn't that obvious to figure out okay okay now we're able to simulate those tags so we started our quest for relevant values. Now, within those 33 bytes, you have multiple different logical values. And because we had done some reverse engineering, we, we knew like human readable names for some of the fields. And some of the names sounded quite promising. This is a bit like if you have a web application and then you have a URL parameter that says admin equals false. So obviously, the first thing you do is try to flip that to true and see whether it works. This is kind of the same. Some of the fields sounded more promising. And it failed. Close, but no cigar. And I would say this was somewhat devastating. That there had been quite many failures up to this point, and we were like, ah, what are we going to do now? 
So, more. <laughs> so, so we had to come up with a new plan. And we figured out that let's do it the other way around. Let's try to find the irrelevant values. And what I mean by this is that we were able to get our hands on a real master key to a real hotel, legitimately. We got one. That's of the official story, and we're sticking to it. Yes. <laughs> so we got one of those master keys, and what we did was we started corrupting the fields on the card one by one. And now, if you corrupt the field and the card stops working, then you know that okay, that field is relevant. You need to have the right value in that field in order for the key to work as a master key. And we did it. We were able to identify the correct fields. And now we just had one problem and key space is one of them. Because the most relevant value, it had so many bits that, yeah, if, if you have a wide range of values, you don't know which one is correct. There's typically one approach, just one approach you can take, and that's brute forcing. And that's what we did. We built custom Proxmark firmware to brute force those values. If you want to build something like this, it's, it's not that difficult because there's already the functionality to simulate a card. The only thing we had to do was simulate one card, then change the data a bit, simulate again, change the data a bit, and simulate again. The biggest challenge here was that how do you make the reader, the lock, realize that you should read the hotel key card again? So what I wanted to do was to mimic the human behavior. If you hold your hotel key card to the lock, and for some reason the door doesn't open, what you typically do is you take the card away, and then you bring it back to the reader again. So this was the behavior we wanted to mimic in the firmware. And the most simple, definitely not the most elegant, but the most simple way to do this was to turn off the radio field by putting the proxmark in the reader mode. Because when the proxmark is in the reader mode, the lock's like, okay, there's no more cards here. And when you simulate the card again, the lock is like, ah, oh, we have a new card, and then it will read it. And when you do this in a loop, you're brute forcing. You're brute forcing one attempt per second, which isn't really that fast. To illustrate how slow it is, if you would need to brute force a value of four bits, I mean, you're good. That's 16 seconds. When we go up to 16 bits, that's 18 hours. And I can tell you a little secret. It, it was more than 16 bits, so. It's, it's not feasible in the real world. So we had gotten this far, but couldn't really do anything useful with, with it. And that got us thinking that this thing is hugely complex. And what we have not mentioned previously is that reverse engineering this thing to death doesn't really help because all the installations are unique. And and that, that was kind of the thing that helped us to figure out a shortcut. We would like to think that we are reasonably smart. Well, forget that. But anyways, uh, there, there has to be a process how you actually install these things. And once we were, we kind of had this idea that there may be, there is a process, uh, we started doing kind of open source intelligence type of work and figured out that there is a thing called Assemble University. And although we didn't uh, get credentials to this place, we realized that they have to teach a certain way how you go and deploy a new hotel. And that allowed us to limit the key space from gazillion to about 20 tries. And this is how it looks. 
So you check in to a hotel. You're enjoying your martini there. You forget your wallet there. No, you forget your key there. The only thing that we need is half a second to clone that key. And of course, we can check into the same hotel, use any key, expired or, or whatever. Then we have to find a lock. Any lock will do, or number of locks will do. And once we were able to get in, we know that, or the, when, once the light is green, we know that we have a master key. So here we are pressing or pushing the buttons on an elevator. And because we don't have a master key, we can go to the floors that we don't have a key for. And once we have the master key, you can go anywhere you want. This was the easiest way to visualize it without breaking the law. So let's talk about being a ghost. To recollect or to, to go this once more, we need the, the prerequisites for this attack is a key card. And any key card will do. It can be expired. It can, it can be from your stay five years ago. It can be the key to the garage door, to the gym. Uh, any valid key card for, for the, the hotel will do. Employee key card, you just name it. And then you need to have an access to that lock. And that will enable you to be a ghost. So the second phase of this attack is that we need to try those different combinations against a lock. And we can do that against a single lock. So let's say that we go to this garage door and we brute force the key space through, and at one point we will find the master key. Or we can distribute the brute forcing across all the locks in the hotel. So there will be only one try per lock. And this effectively will leave an audit trail to those logs, to those locks. And each and every lock will record 600 events per lock, if you happen to have the most high-end version of the lock. And what's stored there is the user ID code, area code, time of the event, and then a few bits. The problem here is that we control all the values except timestamp. So there are multiple ways to do it. We can either uh, overflow the buffer so that it will only show valid entries, or we can impersonate somebody, or we can pretty much do whatever we want. And the, the thing that makes this even worse is that, remember this? There are those doors, they are, they are standalone. So in order to read that audit trail, you need to use Adidas network, walk to the door, put this thing to the lock, read out the log, and then go to some other place and analyze it. And we think that nobody will ever do that, especially when the only thing that you can trust is the timestamp. So that makes you a ghost. So the only thing left was what? Post like a boss. But wait, there is more. If you are working for this industry, the first thing that you would do is to port scan the hell out of this backend. And that's exactly what we did. So we came up with another plan. So we will analyze the software and see if we can compromise it either locally or remotely. And the beautiful piece of software that uh, Vision is, it looks like this. And has open network shares. And according to the documentation, you can mount the network share, because that's how they distribute the database file. Um, unfortunately, that's not really practical. And many of the deployments don't really do that. But there is also a Sybase database server listening on that port. And it, the database passwords are derived from magic constants. 
and these are the passwords for the demo installation. So by reverse engineering those, you can log into the database, get full access, and do whatever you like. So we have visualized that database, it's pretty complex, and it contains interesting pieces of information. So all the employee data is there. So if you happen to run a casino or something, it might be interesting. Or all the card user data is there. And to make it worse, there is a field here that actually stores your key, meaning that you can do this. We are in the same network, let's say a conference network, and then you start dumping the usernames room for rooms, and it, by copy-pasting this value here, you can impersonate anybody. Greetings to Dave on it. So, the kind of thing that was left here is... <laughs> Conclusions. So, like mentioned earlier, if you're not smart, you have to be persistent. We are not saying that this is something that you cannot do. You can, you, you spend a few months on this, you will most probably figure out the same stuff. The trick that we did was that we invested 15 years to it. Um, and I learned that doing physical access control is super hard. Well, doing it is easy, but doing it right is hard. You need to get the physical or the mechanics right. You need to get the networking right. You need to get SDR stuff or the radio layer right. You have to be able to do proper software engineering with SDLC and all that stuff. Uh, you can't use Delphi um, and, and, and so on. So it, it's, it, it requires many things. And it would not be fair to make fun of these guys because it, it's been around for ages. And they've been updating and updating and updating it. But at, at some point, there is a limit because attackers will only get better and it's more difficult for a defender to, to be able to protect uh, this kind of proprietary thing. So we would like to thank our Subloy guys. They took us very, very seriously from the beginning, as their press statement says. Uh, we met with their CTO and their head of engineering uh, and told him basically worked 12 months with them so that they could protect their customers. We would like to also thank lots of people that we have met over the years, many of them being our friends. Um, we started when the community was still kind of young, and we wouldn't be here without these guys. We have learned tons of things uh, from the community, and we kind of hope that it will stay the way it was 15 years ago. It won't, but we're still kind of hoping that it will. And I guess that's pretty much it. Thank you.